given enzymes. You've got to give it steadily and regularly to keep the oxidizing ability up and the healing. Okay, so we have to detoxify on the one hand, but with the same juices that we use for detoxifying, we flood the body with the minerals and enzymes and vitamins that it needs, and the healing is initiated. Now we have a problem. How does the body heal cancer? There's only one way. You cannot reverse a cancerous cell and make it back into a normal cell. Impossible. Physiologically, biologically impossible. Therefore, the only way the body has to fight cancer is to kill the tumor cell. But when we give the body oxidizing enzymes, oxidation kills cancer because cancer is a fermentative metabolism. You can do that in vitro, in a test tube. Introduce oxidation and the cancer dies. Give it a fermentative metabolism, it flourishes in the test tube. So, when we now introduce oxidation into the body, force it into the tumor mass by the addition of iodine, my father explains that, you can read on that in Appendix 2. These oxidizing enzymes now help the body kill the tumor mass. And as I said, now we have a brand new problem. Because this tumor mass is a mass of dead tissue now in your bloodstream. Dead, rotting tissue. Now what happens if you eat rotten meat? You get pretty sick. This rotten meat, though, is in your stomach and intestinal tract. The rotten flesh that you've killed off in your tumor is in the bloodstream. And that makes you feel pretty miserable. Unless you get it out all the time. Unless you open the liver and bile all the time continually with the caffeine, the coffee enemas, the patient now will get a liver intoxication, self-intoxication, and die in a liver coma. But if you give the coffee enemas regularly enough, minimum every four hours, in some cases we had to step it up to every two hours around the clock, the patient feels good, the tumor masses are reduced, are eliminated, the tumor is gone. The only mistake you can make with this therapy is not to give enough coffee enemas and to cause the body to intoxify itself in the course of healing. My father describes also in this appendix a few cases where he didn't detoxify rapidly enough and the patient died of a liver coma, no tumors. He didn't die of cancer, of the toxic liver, because he didn't detoxify rapidly enough. It's explained in Appendix 2. All right, now, if you have eliminated the tumor and the toxicity from your body, then you say, well, the tumor is gone, I'm healthy. No, you're not. <coughs> The tumor is gone and the body no longer has this load of the cancer. But if we were to say now you are healthy, we would be making the exact same mistakes as the doctors make when they cut out the tumor and tell you now you're healthy, we've got every last bit of it. Because they haven't done anything yet about your sick organs, about your damaged, depleted, toxic organs. And we don't stop there or else the tumor would come back pretty rapidly. Now comes the long, difficult, and drawn out, and tedious process of rebuilding your body, rebuilding the organs, so that they will again handle all your digestion totally and completely. And let me read you here what my father says. I learned that in all degenerative diseases, one must not treat the symptoms. The body, the whole body, has to be treated. And then he says, for all our intake food to be properly digested, for the other organ of the digestive tract to function right and help in the digestion to the end product, 
that's the key, the end product. And at the same time to eliminate all the waste products, all the toxins and poisons which must be eliminated so that nothing will accumulate in our system, I thought that this was the most important thing in the treatment. And it still is. And it still is for the cancer patient. But in order to do this, the liver, the pancreas, and all the digestive system has to function totally and completely to be able to break down your food to the end product and eliminate it completely, totally, so that no toxicity, no partially digested proteins and fats float around in your system, fats that might cause anything from psoriasis to heart trouble to high blood pressure and so on, proteins that can cause everything from uh, gout or arthritis to cancer. All the products that you eat have to be totally digested and completely eliminated so that nothing accumulates. Then you have a healthy body. Now, before this happens, you have to rebuild the organs. And the rebuilding process is essentially the same as the original healing because we have to continue to flood the body with the vitamins and enzymes and minerals in the fresh juices, in the fresh food, and the raw food, and the freshly cooked things. No salt added. Salt must be eliminated as an additive. There's enough salt in all your natural foods, plenty for all your requirements. Any salt you add will cause trouble. I have been raised and have lived all my life without salt. You can't tell me that I lack salt. And the body has to be totally restored, not just by pills, because the really seriously ill, damaged, depleted body can't even pick up the material out of pills. It needs the fresh, total quality of the fresh foods in their live, activated completeness. Your body isn't designed to take pills. Take the fresh stuff. It's all there in nature. Of course, if it's organically grown, it's best. But many of you can't always get organically grown material. Nevertheless, get raw, fresh foods. It's better than the same junk that's also not organically grown in cans and jars and bottled and preserved and pickled and dyed and dead. Get it live. And then my father said, this liver of yours is the only organ in the body that's totally restorable. You can cut a piece out, it'll regrow. It's the only part of your body that'll do that. The liver is totally restorable if it doesn't have too much damage and too much weakness. Some, in some cases, he was not able to fully restore the liver. Then he had to tell the patient they had to stick close to this diet for the rest of their lives or risk a recurrence. But I saw a woman who had had pancreas cancer, 100% deadly. She stayed on this diet very exactly for about a year and a half tapered off slowly for another year or so. I happened to see her riding on a plane to Florida. Fifteen years later, not only was she alive and well, which in itself was quite a miracle, but she had a cocktail in one hand and a cigarette in the other. I, I was asked the other day, well, do you think that one should do that? No, I don't think one should do that. If you've had cancer, <laughs> why ask for trouble? I wouldn't do it. It's not a very smart idea, but patients will make these experiments on themselves. And she apparently was doing fine and was surviving and was maintaining her health. That is total restoration of all the organs, total healing, so that the body could handle these materials, detoxify to the end product, and keep her healthy. That is total healing, ladies and gentlemen. The rebalancing of your total body, of all the organs, not just to eliminate the tumor, but to rebuild. That is the number two of the two basic steps of healing. 
detoxify and totally rebuild the body by giving the right material to work with. How did my father arrive at all this? He had migraines, he was sick. He was 25 or 6 years old and he was incapacitated two or three days out of every week. And he was unable to function. And he asked his professors and teachers what to do. And they told him, look it up in the book, you know it's incurable. So he thought about it and decided that there was something wrong in his body chemistry. That these spasms that were giving him this terrible pain and nausea, vomiting and all of that, must be somewhere caused by some chemical change in his body. And he decided to change his body chemistry through food. He had no help, no guidance. And he thought that probably milk would be the most easily digestible food since all babies can digest it. And he lived on milk for a week or two, and he was just as sick as ever. And then he decided that milk is a food designed for babies, and no adult animal in nature lives on milk. And he took fruit instead, what nat natural animals and ancestors way back were living on. And he found that when he lived on apples and fruit and nothing but, he was free of migraines. Then he would add one thing after the other to see what he could eat and what he couldn't eat. And it was very simple because the moment he would eat something that didn't agree with him, he would get a new migraine very rapidly. It takes a half hour, an hour, I know. And very soon he had worked out the foods that he could eat and those that he couldn't eat. And those that he could eat, he called his migraine diet. And later when patients came into his practice and complained of a migraine, he would tell them, the books say there's nothing you can do, but this is what I do, try it. And he invariably found that they recovered, that their migraines disappeared. Until one day, a patient came in complaining of migraine and was given the migraine diet and returned in about three weeks and said, Doctor, my migraines are gone, but I also had lupus, skin tuberculosis. And that's gone. So my father said, no, that's impossible. Lupus is incurable. It must have been something else. No, no, I have the lab reports, the bacteriological studies. Let me see. And sure enough, he had had lupus. And my father thought for sure now he would get the Nobel Prize because the man who discovered the cause of lupus got the Nobel Prize. But it was incurable, right? What about the man who discovered the cure? Well, what happened was his shingle outside said internal and nerve specialist. He had been trained under Ottfried First of a top neurosurgeon in Europe. And he was an internist. And when he then proceeded to cure other lupus cases, he was accused and sued by the other doctors for transgressing his specialty. And they wanted to take his license away. But the judge in those days, not like we have in California now, said, uh, ask these other doctors that were accusing him, well, can you cure lupus or you or you or you? Well, no, it's incurable. <laughs> Well, why don't you let this man do it? But this isn't what happens today in California. You may not know. In California, there is a law on the book, a state law, called the anti-quackery law. And this law states specifically that no doctor is allowed to treat cancer by any but the orthodox method, spelling them out, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. And if he does, He's subject to five years in jail, $10,000 fine, and the loss of his license. And you know that a doctor has been jailed. He used my father's therapy plus some laetrile, and he had excellent results. And when he was dragged before the court and offered the judge to show him cases that recovered people who had been terminal and in pain and in misery, 
and who are now well and working and active and normal. This judge today, a few years ago, said, I don't care about the cases. You broke the law and put him in jail. Would you say that a man who cures cancer should be on a pedestal? No, he goes to jail. And other doctors in California are still losing their licenses for doing the same and are accused and are under attack and have to fight for their freedom and their freedom to practice and your freedom to choose. That's why I urge you again, put all your voices and your energies together into groups of this type Support the ISCBF so that we can continue to fight for you, for your right to be cured, and for your doctors to stay out of jail if they help you. Because cancer is a great, big, tremendous business. And the American Cancer Society that has its hand out to you for donation owns 50% of the patents of one of the most powerfully poisonous chemotherapeutic drugs called 5-FU. This drug has a code of 10 to 25 LD. Many of you may not know what that means. It means lethal doses. It means that you die just from getting it. But because they own the patents, and they make money on it. They block, with the funds you give them, they block research into non-toxic therapies. Be careful who you give your money to. And learn about non-toxic therapies, and learn about prevention, and learn about nutrition. But prevention starts much, much before your Age prevention starts with a mother. Prevention starts with the soil, healthy soil and healthy food. Prevention starts with infant feeding. Did you know that the mother's milk, for instance, is a great deal higher in potassium than any cow's milk? Now, when your doctor gives you formula, it gives you a dried or a powdered or a canned milk and it gets modified with sugars or lactose or dextrose or whatever to try to bring it as close as possible to mother's milk. Where do they ever tell you to add potassium? Animals grow rapidly. Rapid growth is, is sodium. The cow grows up in two years or two and a half or three. Where is your infant at two or two and a half or three? It's an infant still. And slowly developing and the excellence of the brain depends on potassium, on high differentiation. If you show off your baby that it's big and fat and strong, you're raising a cow, not a baby. Let your baby grow slowly. Be sure that that baby has a well-differentiated brain, that these cells, with the help of potassium in the mother's milk, are well differentiated and that this child is normal and intelligent and not a cow. But where do the doctors ever tell you about potassium? Oh, the, all your food is very high in potassium. Yes, as it comes out of the garden and off the trees and out of the soil. But if you buy it from the $110 billion food industry packaging, if you buy convenience, you're going to pay for that convenience. It may save you time in the kitchen and to pop a, a can or a tray of TV dinner in your oven and it's ready in five or ten minutes. And it may save you time to open a baby jar and it's ready. And it's convenient because that's what the food industry sells you, convenience, saving time in your kitchen. But I assure you it's not convenient when your child has leukemia or when you have cancer, or your teenager has diabetes. So beware of convenience. You pay for it very dearly. Thank you.
handing out sheets of paper for you to get questions. We're going to have one half hour of questions. I want you to feed them up here to the front. I'll monitor them and hand them to Charlotte, and she's going to give us one half hour of your explicit and explicit questions. So let's get the questions started on the written form only. Up here just as quickly as we can, and we'll get into this. Please try to keep your questions general. I do not diagnose, I will not give you specific treatments. I, I'm not a doctor, so uh, keep your questions of general interest if possible. Okay, here's a nice one in light of that. Can a brain tumor be helped when the patient is on chemotherapy? Chemotherapy is a very, very terrible subject. I have, in the nutrition center, which we ran about a year and a half ago, a Gerson Nutrition Center in Los Angeles, I tried to detoxify people who were on chemotherapy. They responded well for two or three months. The detoxifying was terrible. The toxicity caused by chemotherapy was terrible, but they did pull out of it. None of them survived. When this toxic material called chemotherapy, which is so highly toxic, it does first attack the tumor, but a close second attacks the total body and the body's ability to heal, the liver, the bone marrow, and all the areas in the body that have to do the healing and that we have to reactivate to heal, this chemical stuff called chemotherapy is so powerfully destructive that when we start the detoxifying, this material pours back into the bloodstream from wherever the body has stored it, causes the same toxic symptoms again, and the cancer regrows because we cannot overcome it. I suggest for anybody who's had chemotherapy, there are other methods do not use this Gerson therapy, the detoxifying uh, causes new problems, and a total healing, I believe, is impossible after chemotherapy. You can maintain a level of health of functioning, but a total restoring of all organs after chemotherapy, in my experience, was not possible. Okay, uh, would you recommend the use of added potassium daily to a person who now has fairly good health? Yes, I would. I do use potassium daily. I have used it probably for 30 years. Loss of potassium means aging, means chronic disease. Since our foods, even fresh and raw foods, if not all organically grown, are probably potassium depleted, it's a good idea to add potassium to your daily diet. How about granular kelp? Is that acceptable? Which? Granular kelp. Kelp. Uh, kelp is used fairly uh, extensively because of its high content in iodine. And of course, iodine is important and is necessary as an addition. But you want to be a little bit careful of materials that come from the sea, from the ocean. They are likely to be high in sodium, too. I do believe that, especially for healthy people, kelp is beneficial, yes. Is it possible to get fresh fruits and vegetables? Uh, many things appear to be fresh, but how can you tell? Those things that appear to be fresh, a fresh raw apple, a fresh pear and orange, a fresh head of lettuce, are still fresher than anything you get out of a box. And you know very well that if you take a lettuce, put it in some water, and you can, even if it is a little wilted, you can reactivate it and it will become crisp again. That means it is alive. Nothing out of a can or a jar or a frozen package will do that. Whatever you can get fresh is vastly superior to anything that isn't, even if it only appears to be fresh and you know it's been shipped from Gus knows uh, California, my, uh, Florida, or Texas, or somewhere, because in the winter here, obviously, you can't get fresh garden vegetables. It is still much preferable. 
to anything packaged dead and gone dead. Here's an easy one. If a person has cancer in both breasts and has refused all previous treatment, can they be helped with your diet? Well, I don't very much like this kind of question because in a way I feel that I have not been adequately explicit in what I was trying to put across. When we heal, we heal totally. It doesn't matter where the cancer is. If it's in the head or in the toe or in the bones or in the uh, muscles or in the liver or in the lungs or in the breast or in the stomach, it doesn't make any difference. When you heal, you heal. Not selectively, you heal. It so happens that breast cancer, since it is usually a glandular cancer, is a little more difficult. It takes longer. It is harder to heal because, as my father also explains in his book, when cancer is inside the gland, the gland is like a closed off unit. And when cancer blocks both entrance and exit, it's difficult for this newly oxygenated, newly elevated and oxygizing blood to get to this cancer. So this cancer responds very slowly, but it does. While I was lecturing in Florida uh, about a year ago, uh, as I was finished with my talk and walking off the stage, a lady comes up to me. She says, I'm Mrs. Stone, so do you remember me? I said, I certainly do. She was about 77 years old. She had been a patient of my father's uh, some 25 years earlier for breast cancer, had had no other therapy. She was alive and well and had both her breasts. Nothing was removed. It can be healed. It takes a good deal of time, much energy, and much patience, but it can be done. Dr. Kelly states that using, about using buttermilk enemas, is this good in the, the light that milk is mucus forming? Dr. Kelly is a very painful subject to me. <laughs> Dr. Kelly, I know him quite well personally. I have spoken to him. He told me that he cured himself of cancer by my father's book. He then wrote a little pamphlet, One Answer to Cancer, which is good. It helps a lot of people, has helped a lot of people. It takes basically this therapy and simplifies it. And in many cases, it still worked well enough. My father was able to take terminal cases that came in on stretchers and had days to live Kelly says a person can be helped if they have at least three months to live. That's still pretty good. And he has had good results. But he has recently changed this more and more. He has changed the therapy to the extent that it's hardly recognizable. He has added something like 150 pills, vitamins, and minerals. And I told you what my thought is about pills. He has done other things. He feeds the information into a computer and the computer will spit out material and it'll say that your blood shows low in protein, therefore he tells you to eat protein, fish and eggs, and it doesn't work anymore. I don't like to say this. I don't like to go into it because he was doing a good job. He was using my father's method basically. And I feel that all the doctors or nutritionists or people who go into this type of work should be helped and supported. But I have seen a lot of trouble since he has changed over the years. Do you recommend papaya and pineapple bromelain for preventive digestion for people whose intake of too much protein in older people? I don't like to recommend anything specifically. Yes, digestive uh, enzymes are good to use, but wouldn't it make more sense not to take in too much protein in the first place? Why don't you cut your intake? For one thing, you should cut out meat altogether. Now, all your nutritionists tell you you need protein and protein and protein, all the way, Adele Davis and uh, uh, Carson Fredericks and uh, you name them, there's a whole lot of them. 
They tell you you need 68 or 100 grams of protein a day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure I don't take more than 10 grams a day. Cotton Frederick claims that if you don't get at least 40 or 60, you couldn't stand up for 10 minutes, you would collapse with weakness. Do I look that weak? <laughs> it is dangerous to take so much protein. It is especially dangerous, and this is also brought out in the testimony that I just mentioned to you earlier, uh, that was given to the Senate Select Committee by Dr. Gorey, Dr. Winder, and a whole lot of others, that the American diet is too high in protein, meat particularly. Meat has been extolled as a wonderful protein food. It is not. Meat, first of all, has to be killed. By the time you get it, it's dead. The moment meat is dead, it starts to decay. Not only that, then you have to go proceed and cook it. You further denature it. You kill part of the uh, protein fraction. You feel you're getting a whole protein, you're not. Chymotrypsin and one of the other fractions is killed by cooking and denatured. Plus, meat is usually high in cholesterol. The very material, the high cholesterol and the high protein that tend to cause cancer. And Ernest Winder testified that with a high cholesterol and meat diet, there is more colon cancer and breast cancer in this country than anywhere else. Why? Why do you have to eat too much protein? Don't take enzymes, cut your protein intake. Uh, while de in detoxification, does it help to stop the nicotine urge? How's that for a ringer? <laughs> for people I, that have trouble stopping smoking. All right. I explained to you that we get people who have been on morphine every four hours. We were able to take them off it entirely and completely without any tapering off. And nobody had any so-called cold turkey. Why not? When you give the body the fresh raw juices, on a basis of every hour. When you detoxify the body with uh, coffee enemas every four hours, there is no cold turkey. The urge for smoking is a deficiency in your body. You're craving something, you don't know what it is. You know smoking relieves this urge by beating something into your bloodstream. It will relieve the urge. But as the nicotine wears off, you get new spasms, new cramps, and you reach for another cigarette. Smoking, alcoholism, any drug addiction, sleeping pills, pain relievers, whatever, you name them, including tranquilizers, uh, are deficiency diseases. As you take enough juices, enough fresh foods, enough enzymes, and supply your body with what it actually needs and wants and has an urge for, you lose your requirement for, or your need, or your urge to smoke. One other little thing. My father shows that in the treatment of cancer, he was using niacin, vitamin B3. Niacin is known as nicotinic acid. It is, rely, it is related to nicotine, as carbon dioxide is related to carbon monoxide. If you take, instead of reaching for a cigarette, if you supply your body with plenty of juices, enzymes, minerals, and vitamins, and take, instead of a cigarette, a little bit of vitamin B3 all day long, you can take as much as you like, you kill your urge for smoking. By the way, anyone who has questions of a specific nature, be advised that we're going to have workshops with the individual speakers in them, at four o'clock, as per your program. If you look at four o'clock, there will be individual rooms for specific questions to be answered. So we're gonna to try to be general here. Next question, Dr. Contreras in Mexico on the Laetrile program says, too much carrot juice will damage the liver. When a patient gets yellow, you should stop. Is this true? And no. how much should you take? It's not true. I've used carrot juice for 30 years, 40 years. My mother... She is a little yellow, isn't she? <laughs> uh, the carotene gives a little yellow discoloration to the skin, to your palm, and so on. Completely, absolutely not dangerous. Next question. 
How much hope is there for bone cancer? Is there a difference between bone marrow cancer and bone cancer? There is a difference between bone marrow cancer and bone cancer, yes. There is hope for both, unless there's been chemotherapy or too much radiation. Uh, my only statement earlier about bone cancer was that relieving the pain in bone cancer takes longer. It will heal nevertheless, but the pain is a problem because we cannot use drugs. What about food drying? If you must preserve food, drying is probably the only acceptable way. But you must then not live on dry foods. You should use those sparingly as a supplement to your general diet, but be sure you always have live, fresh, raw foods. Where do you suggest treatment after chemotherapy? Maybe that's unfair. <laughs> I, uh, now that you're I, have seen, I have seen people helped with uh, B17, with Laetrile. I have seen people helped with just a general good diet approach. Uh, all I can say at that point is maintain your nutrition the best you can, uh, get all the vitamins you can, and keep your body level functioning as, at the highest possible point without going into total detoxification. In a diabetic, uh, would it be safe and beneficial to add potassium in the diet? Most certainly. Potassium is always needed. Professor Albert Schweitzer, who made this statement at the top of the book, came to my father with diabetes at age 75. He was put on a high-protein diet, as all diabetics are. Protein, protein, protein. No carbohydrates. And he felt terrible, was weary, and had problems. As you know, Diabetics usually develop eye trouble, kidney trouble, heart trouble, arteriosclerosis, eventually gangrene, and so on. All of this is unnecessary. We put the diabetic on high amounts of juices, especially the green juices, raw, fresh greens, and we were able to reactivate the pancreas, and they were able to cut out the insulin. Where can they get potassium? And is uh, in a pill or liquid form? The potassium my father used, he put together after more than 300 experiments. It is a combination of three potassium salts. They're detailed in the book. Potassium gluconate, potassium acetate, and potassium phosphate uh, in a 10% solution. However, these are prescription items and are not readily available. There are other forms of potassium available. Many health food stores carry uh, potassium gluconate by itself in a tablet, or you can also get potassium chloride. If you're curing cancer, I would suggest that you try to get this combination, as my father outlined it. Will the Gerson therapy help a stroke victim? Certainly. However, as I tried to bring out before, the only totally restorable organ in the body is the liver. Now, when there's been a stroke, and there is damage in the central nervous system. The central nervous system is not restorable. Any portion of it that's dead is dead. If, for instance, such a patient has totally lost the function uh, of, of half a side or uh, the speech or anything like that, uh, it's difficult to bring that back. Or if you've lost an eyesight or if you lost hearing on one ear, these are parts of the central nervous system and cannot be restored. Once they're dead, they're dead. But first of all, we relieve the arteriosclerosis, which is an underlying problem. Secondly, we increase circulation and we can restore damaged areas that are not yet dead. And we can usually rebuild the patient to the highest possible level. But what's dead is dead. In keeping with that, can the pancreas be brought back to normal? Yes. Is it harmful to take coffee enemas day after day for many months? No, we gave it for many years. I had a very interesting lady who had cancer, was my father's patient about 24 years ago, uh, who recovered totally and completely, and uh, she was actually working with me in the nutrition center. When she is capable, when she is able to get her juices, she drinks her juices. If she doesn't get her juices, she is still well and functioning. Uh, at times, when she is able to, she takes a uh, coffee enema. When she is traveling and is not able to, she doesn't. She functions well anyway, at least two bowel movements a day. Contrary to what many doctors will tell you, it does not damage your liver. 
Some doctors have said it beats your liver uh, like a stick. No way, it relieves your liver of toxicity. There is no damage you can do with too many enemas. As I said before, the only problem is not enough. What's the uh, long-range effect of lithium in your diet? Lithium, in your is, lithium is deadly. Chemistry, you know that lithium is directly above sodium. When, during the first, uh, Second World War, uh, some chemical companies came out with something new, a salt substitute for people on salt-restricted diet. What was it? Lithium chloride. It wasn't until after eight people died that this was taken off the market. Be careful with substitutes. What kind of coffee is best for coffee enemas? Plain ground bean coffee. Fresh ground? Fresh ground. Okay. What is the best way to flush hardened mucus from the system? First of all, avoid mucus forming foods. In other words, live on vegetarian foods. Fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, fresh juices. And then take your coffee enema. that will take it all out. What do you think of protein powders, such as, say, Shackley or whatever? It's a complete protein, which meat isn't. Do you think this is... I tried to point out to you that protein is damaging and dangerous, that you want to cut down protein to the very lowest possible level. Don't use additives of protein. If you want to take some protein, as I do, I take a little bit of defatted milk protein like yogurt, defatted pre-digested milk, milk protein. I take perhaps a jar of yogurt or half a jar of yogurt and some cottage cheese in the course of a day. It's enough. Do you recommend coffee as a beverage? No. Coffee as a beverage doesn't have anywhere, anywhere, nearly resembling the effect of coffee as an enema. It will cause spasms, it, cause, uh, it causes um, stomach cramps, it has acidity and uh, aromatic acids. It causes actually the bile to, uh, to have a soapy effect and it doesn't do anything like the coffee enema. Coffee, therefore, is more a toxic material, falls into the category of alcohol and nicotine and so on. Where can you get fresh calves liver? That, ladies and gentlemen,